Welcome to the final whistle. The Warriors, they started well against the Sharks at Jubilee Oval to wrap up round 17 of the competition, but Cronulla came storming home in the end, winning 20 points to 12 and now sitting inside the eights. <laughs> that earned $10,000 uh, to the Mossy Masoy Foundation, thanks to Sportsbet, uh, that post-try celebration. Roger Tuivasa-Shek, a star on the losing side. Another star out there on the pitch today was Sean Johnson for the Cronulla Sharks, heading the Warriors' way next year. Uh, thanks for joining us, Sean, on the final whistle. Uh, we'll get to the match shortly. Uh, the big news uh, we've just been told as we uh, come to you right now, the NRL are currently telling clubs based in Sydney, the ACT, they will be relocating by Wednesday to South East Queensland uh, to keep the competition going. Have you heard any of this news and uh, what's your reaction to it? Yeah, I just uh, got told just before about the news and um, initially I was pretty disappointed, if I'm being honest, obviously. Um, not too keen on leaving home, um, a young family, um, a little daughter as well, so um, it's the situation we find ourselves in at the moment. Um, and ultimately, if we can still uh, have jobs, you know, we, we should be, count ourselves pretty lucky in this current climate. So uh, we'll get up there. Hopefully the weather's a little warmer than it is down here and um, enjoy the rest of the year. Yeah, complicated beast, uh, this one, no doubt, uh, with uh, over time. They'll work, work out the perimeters, uh, hopefully involving families as well. Uh, in terms of the football, uh, you'll be heading up to South East Queensland in form. A bit of a hiccup last week, but making up for this afternoon and, and inside the eight where you want to be. Yeah, we were uh, obviously pretty disappointed with how we uh, performed last week and the intent and attitude we showed up with um, and that was our main focus tonight. Um, a big physical forward pack the Warriors have and I thought our middles did a great job at setting that benchmark and setting the tone nice and early and um, obviously a couple of nice tries on the edge there. So uh, overall, yeah, pretty happy with that performance, man. We made it harder on ourselves at the end and we keep seeming to shoot ourselves in the foot but uh, we managed to hold on and uh, ultimately come away with the two points. Sean, when Cronulla are at their best, what, what type of game does that look like? Honestly, man, I think a, a simple game. Um, change of angle, you know, playing through teams. Um, you know, we, we've done that the past month and that's when we've felt best. Um, you know, like, the game's sped up, so I think the more tries you can score through the front door, the better. Um, you know, and you're sort of over the ad line, constantly applying that pressure on the D, and um, that's sort of where we've probably made a few adjustments to our game and uh, it seems to be working for us at the moment. I guess when I think of your game, I think of uh, your footwork and your speed on a nice, hard, flat surface. Um, but you look very much at home in look, dewy conditions in this one. It's, is that especially the kicking game and the involvement? It, yeah. Do you feel at home in, in that sort of situation? Yeah, look, still, I'm pleased you sort of picked up on that. You know, obviously, um, probably the perception of me is the stepper, the, the flashy guy. But um, over the past few years, I've really tried to develop my game management and um, obviously kicking game. And in conditions like tonight, I feel like uh, I felt like that was going to be the difference. So I've, I've put a lot of focus on that. Um, you know, a lot of men mental prep and a lot of mental reps went into um, how I was going to handle last plays. And uh, I thought the side that could, I guess, build the most pressure would ultimately come away with the win. And um, you now our boys got around the park nice tonight. They were reacting, they were moving fast. And um, my role on the side was to, yeah, roll it into the end goal and just keep, keep banging on that front door. And um, yeah, man, like, it worked for us tonight. So hopefully we can keep building on it. Sean, I know you're going to say it's one week at a time, but I looked at your draw a couple of weeks ago. Of all the top eight contenders around where you are, you tend to have the best draw, or at least the draw where you know, there's a lot of good wins coming up for you. Have you had a look at it yourself? Uh, yes, I have, Gus. No, I'm definitely not one week at a time, man. I know well, I'm well aware of what's <laughs> ahead of us and the opportunity that's ahead of us, man. And um, yeah, it's a great it's a great opportunity. You know, we we had a rough start to the year, with, you know, for a number of reasons. Um, but the way that the group's galvanised over the past month, in particular. Um, it's going to be a waste if we don't go on and do something special this year. So, um, you know, we've got some opportunities ahead of us, but, you know, back to that point, you can't really look too far ahead. Um, I think we've got Canberra. Is it Canberra next week? Canberra down in Canberra. Um, and that's always a tough game in itself. So, yeah, we'll get ready for that. Good on you, Sean. Appreciate your time here on the final whistle. Well played, and, uh, we'll, we'll see you in South East Queensland. There he is, Sean Yeah, look Johnson. forward to it, eh? <laughs> <laughs> tough, <laughs> tough times, isn't it? It's a weird scenario. Um, and moving best, if you had noticed, Peter Sterling and uh, Phil Gould with me here for the final whistle. Oh, this one. And the details only just sort of coming out as we speak. I imagine there's a lot of phone calls and conferences being uh, held from NRL HQ with the clubs on where this situation stands. But desperate times, desperate measures, Peter Sterling. Well, it's, that's exactly right. And it's, you know, to keep the game alive, uh, some tough decisions have been made since the end of May last year or going into May last year. Um, Sean pointed out that while he was shocked by the news or certainly you know, super surprised by it, he understands that to keep the employment going um, is just a measure that needs to be taken. His first priority, of course, was how does this affect my family? We're all waiting to see how that's going to unfold for them. Yep. Um, so it's, yeah, look, it's, it's difficult, but um, we have to, 
we have to take these measures to make sure that everybody stays safe, but we also can keep the game going. Uh, Gus, obviously you're involved with the Warriors quite heavily. You know the logistics they've had to, and the hoops they've had to jump through to, to keep themselves based here. And we're talking family, uh, you know, welfare. Uh, they're isolated from you know, they're, where many of them are from in New Zealand. Now all of a sudden you're going to be having up to, say, 12 teams relocating. Just how hard is it to make something like this happened for such a long time. I've said it a number of times. People just wouldn't understand the sacrifices that they make. I mean, from early last year, uh, where they've had to live away from home and it was unplanned last year, this year it was better, but they've had a camp pre-Christmas in Kiama for half their squad, a month in up in Tamworth. This year they're able to bring families to the Central Coast. Uh, they, star in a, they stay in a, a accommodation up there. Some of the boys went out and rented holiday accommodation so they could have a bit of privacy, some of the single boys out with their own. Um, but all that's got to be turned upside down now. They've got their families with them now, and I know how tight-knit they are. They're going to want to take their families to Queensland with them, and they're going to have to get relocated. It's going to be difficult for all these teams this week, you know, with all the travel that has to be done. I'd imagine they're not commercial flights. They'll be chartering them up there one at a time and finding out which hotel they're standing in, where they get their training, which gymnasium do they go to. Um, it's a, a logistical nightmare at the moment. And, um, you know, the league's saying they're ready for it, so let's hope it works out. And the ripple effect is is profound. Like, just imagine schooling for kids and, you know, all yeah. of those considerations that you have to take in as to you know, how you keep the family unit together, but you, you, know, you take care of those important things as well. We've obviously had a couple of COVID breaches uh, from players over the, the past week or so. Does this help eradicate that or could we be in a scenario now where it'll be all eyes on the one area? Surely, James, surely we're not having another COVID breach after what we've seen in the last two weeks. I mean, my God. I don't think that should be our concern at the moment, although you just never know, footballers. But, look, uh, this is the only way they're going to keep the competition going. The, the, the data is telling us in Sydney that we're going to have more and more positives every day. More and more people will come forward and get testing. The problem is for them is that the ones that are positive, a lot of them have been in the community without knowing that they're positive, which means they're spreading it. And if they give it to five and they give it to five and they give it to five, all of a sudden we're in the... Uh, we're in the thousands, and let's hope it doesn't get to that, but that's what the government is fearing. And we only need one player, one official, one referee, one staff member to get COVID, and we're in trouble. And, and that's the competition's in trouble. And if clubs do go up there and they go into a, a bubble situation, into security and that, it, it may well be north of the border that there might be some freedom yes. for them. As time goes on... Exactly. Yep. Well, they might be able to get out to restaurants and coffee shops and, and do some things during the day and... Uh, and socialise a little bit, but, you know, I don't know what sort of protocols I'll need up there. I don't think there's much COVID in Queensland at the moment. But Sydney's going through a real problem. I mean, a real problem at the moment. It's, it's going to get worse before it gets better. So I said two weeks ago, I said, you've got to get them out. You've got to get them out before this blows up. Everyone can see it coming. Everyone can see it rolling forward. So they've finally bitten the bullet and they've done it this week. The writing was on the wall, I guess, still, though, with the relocation when Gold Coast was all of a sudden announced as the third... Uh, venue uh, mm. for Game 3 of State of Origin. Got a feel for Nova Castrians who are about to have their first, uh, the Gold Coast. It's three matches in Queensland and a chance of a, a Blues series sweep. Well, I heard Brad Fittler talk earlier today about um, what a feat that would be to, to win a series, hopefully 3-0 from their point of view, with all of those games. It, it'll never be done again. Um, it's just one of these... Things that, that's evolved that way. You, you, you could never have planned it. You never thought that this would be the situation. But to actually win a, a series, would it only be the fourth one that New South Wales have ever won? It would only be the eighth one between the two states that has ever been won in close to 40 best of threes. So it's, it would be a feat and, you know, something that these players... They're not worried about their scrapbooks now, but, boy, it'd be something nice to look back on and be a part of. Surely there'd be a few more blue jerseys in the crowd that close to the, the border, as opposed to Townsville, where it was about 99 to 1, Gus? Uh, pretty staunch the Queenslanders up there. Blues are hard to find, and they won't be getting a ticket easily, so there'll That's be true. a lot of Maroons up there. Look, I give Queensland a great chance in this game. I keep going back to the second half of the second game. Everyone was looking at the scoreboard and 26 nil, and it was another flogging. I didn't see it that way at all. Queensland had three tries disallowed. It was only 8 nil the second half. New South Wales have now got a new halves pairing who have never played together before. You know, I can see some clunkiness there, uh, mm. particularly at crucial times. And just listening to blokes like Daly, Cherry Evans and Munster look, talk about the embarrassment of the first two games, if they really look at that second game and build off the back of it, I think they can trouble New South Wales in this contest. As soon as you put Caelan Ponger in any football team, they are a better side. And uh, he, 
He didn't miss a beat in his first game back from Newcastle, and if he can carry that in, you know, the, when your fullback's playing well, it's kind of infectious. Everybody feeds off that, so I'm not putting all the pressure on him, but boy, he's, he's an inclusion. Well, their forward pack looks more tradesman like, it looks more workman like. They'll, they'll make the tackles and make the yards, and that's all you've ever needed from a Queensland forward pack. And then you rely on, you know, Terry Evans and Munster and, um, and now Calum Ponger at the back, and they've got some speed out wide, they can finish. I just think Queensland have got a great chance in this game because I can't see New South Wales being as fluent as what they were in the first two games when they had Cleary and Luai directing the troops around. Now, if Whiten and Moses take a while to gel, if they don't get the football on that they want to play, I can see this being very close and Queensland having enough points to win. Join us from 7pm live exclusively right here on Nines Wide World of Sports for State of Origin Game 3 from the Gold Coast on Wednesday. A quick one on the NRL from the weekend that was like a dog with a bone. Sam Walker with moments to spare in a match. Gus grabbing the ball and bolting down the other end of the field. Cool or not cool? Well, look, players, the last couple of seconds of the clock, players have been playing down the clock for years. They just do it in different ways. I remember Jared Hayne running up into the hill on an Origin game and took the ball with him. They weren't going to play without him. Yeah, it was a bit cheeky, but you now these are things that kids think about when they've got their head on the pillow at night and thinking, if I'm ever in that position, could I, should I, would I, could I? The coach is saying, what the hell was that? Yeah, Luke Keery liked it. I wonder what he said to him in the dressing room after the game. I think he would have pulled him into a cubicle mm. and said... No more sun. Yeah, I, I didn't like it. I think there are things. It's. I, I'd rather be critical of a player for a smart play than a dumb play. That was smart, like in regards to. You know, why I couldn't run that out. far in the 80th minute. Uh, no, I don't know how he had the energy to do and it. And we've seen it before. Tony Iroh back in 1998 for the mm. Adelaide Rams up against the Dragons came up with that play. But I just think there are things. He did it a couple of weeks ago against the Titans. I missed that one. It wasn't, it wasn't, as, it wasn't as far. It wasn't as far. No. It wasn't as. But it was very, very similar to that. Yeah, it's, I just Everyone think, plays for the clock. There, <laughs> there are just some things in the game. And I, I didn't like a few weeks back when Manly scored, Tom Trebojevic got over the line and found his brother and passed the ball to him mm. to put it down. You know, I, I think there are standards in first grade in the NRL that you, you kind of need to meet. And I just don't... That, they don't sit comfortably with me. I'd hate to think that when Ben Trebojevic uh, does look back on his first try, eventually in first grade, because that one was pulled back yep. for uh, something that happened previous, that that wouldn't be the... Yeah. The one that you want to remember where your brother yeah. just handed it to you where you didn't have to sort yeah. of work too hard. So that kind of falls in the same category for me. But like I say, um, it's hard to be critical of a smart play instead of a dumb play, and that, there was nothing dumb about that. Lucky they didn't mow him down one-on-one -on -one strip. Most well, of the that's a, there is one in England, which if you go on <laughs> and have a look at in, I think YouTube, where the player runs back and then he goes to kick the football out and the opposing winger <laughs> comes down and catches it and scores Too to good. win the game. So it is fraught with danger to some degree. Hey, uh, let's wrap things up with On The Clock. This is our little game. I don't think you guys have done the final whistle for a, a while where you finish the sentence for me. So, Sturlo, Matt Dufty to the Bulldogs is... Points. Gus, Matt Dufty to the Bulldogs is... Good signing. All right. The next player to have a COVID breach should... Gus... Have a good laugh and look at himself. <laughs> yeah. The next player to have a COVID breach should? Should have the books run at him just for stupidity on the yep. first point. I'm with you on that. Uh, the man of the series for Origin will be? It's Tom Trebojevic. OK. James Tedesco. OK. Watch this space. Got some options. That was easy. Done, that's it. Why don't we just do that the whole time? No, just, fun, that's, just one word that. answers. Yeah. It's not your forte. <laughs> we were running the clock down there. We were yeah. running backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter Stilling. Thank you, Phil Gould. Thank, Thank you, James. James. That's it for the final whistle. Plenty to come uh, this week. Make sure you join us a big 100% footy Monday night on Nine. And then, of course, 48 hours later, State of Origin 3 exclusively live right here on Nine's Why World of Sports. But for now, it's goodbye.